This episode is brought to you by Honda. When you test drive the all-new Prologue EV, there's a lot that can impress you about it. There's the class-leading passenger space, the clean, thoughtful design, and the intuitive technology. But out of everything, what you'll really love most is that it's a Honda. Visit honda.com slash EV to see offers. Ladies and gentlemen, it is showtime. Please welcome the team of the Fulhamish Podcast. It's the Fulhamish Podcast, your independent voice of Fulham FC. My name is George Cooper and welcome to the show. What is this? Fulham unbeaten in five back-to-back wins. We managed to cling on to that 1-0 win. A very controversial VAR penalty, which we will come on to. Raul Jimenez, cool as you like. Is he back? Yes, he is. Fulham sitting sixth in the table. As a wise man once said, what is the point of being alive if you don't dream? I'm joined by some fantastic gentlemen here today to discuss what was a brilliant win and Fulham's flying start to this Premier League campaign. Smiles all round. George Rossiter, how you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm very well. Drew Heatley, you good? Yeah, I'm buzzing, mate. I'm nursing a slight hangover from a from a night out in Nottingham after that win, but uh, I've rebounded and I'm here. Happy days. You were revisiting your old stomping ground, I believe, weren't you? So did you... Uh, did you fr- did you visit your old your old haunts? We went to a few old haunts and we looked uh, very much like the old men that we were, I think, fresh as we was last week. So uh, we were looking very old. <laughs> was it a classic bumping into students and being like, oh, is, is this place still open? I remember when I was here, I used to, used to be able to get three pints for two quid and a Jaeger bomb. Was yeah. it that kind of caper? <laughs> it was exactly that. And then we ended up sitting in the corner nursing our uh, vodka sodas. <laughs> Happy days, happy days. We're also joined by Charlie Kipp. How are you, sir? Beaming him in from States over over the pond. You're in Florida at the moment, I believe. Yeah, here full time. I'm sure the accent's jarring, but thanks for having me. And uh, excited to talk about a win. Oh, the pleasure is all ours, mate. Uh, you've got some three-word reviews for us, I believe. Would you like to kick off proceedings with them? I do indeed. So we went to Twitter, uh, kicking it old school in terms of sourcing those. And we are looking at Mark Twomey, who had sixth and climbing, which I assume is followed by trees, if we were allowed to fourth word. Uh, but capped it at sixth and climbing. Jacob uh, or Jakob Krupa had spot on Raul. A little bit of a pun going on there. Matt Chantry with Robin Hood Raul. There's a little bit of Raul going on. Stefan Truscott with, I think, my personal favorite, Massive Tree Points. And there were several others about passports, Europe, all that sort of fun stuff. Didn't have time to get to all of them, but they were noticed. And I think for what has to be like the 12th time since we've beaten Forest going back to the championship era, and I'm sure it's not that many. I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but Fulham fell Forest. I think that's probably been the name of like multiple pods. So I, I appreciate it. I respect it. We're going to politely move on just because I think it's a bit of been there, done that. But that doesn't mean I don't like it. So I want to throw the shit out there. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Thanks very much, Kip. Over with uh, those three road reviews. Yeah, there were absolutely hundreds of, uh, of you who got in touch. As is always the case after a big win. George, you were at City Grounds. How was the atmosphere? How was the day? It was good. It was a lovely day. Went to uh, the Canal House before the game, which is a lovely bar. Really enjoyed it there. Had some Oktoberfest stuff going on. The atmosphere of the game was very good. And I kind of always worry when it gets to half time because people are going down to the concourse. You're getting cold. The adrenaline's run out of your body. So the, the quick goal after the break, then going into the last minutes with the, the nail-biting eight added minutes not sure where that came from really behind the team it it was a good atmosphere to be a part of yeah Andrew was your experience similar do you know what I went to I went to the Nest pre-game, which is a uh, Notts County's uh, pre-match sort of venue. It's like this giant warehouse. Think like giant screen for football, like Euros, World Cup vibes. Loads of picnic, uh, loads of picnic benches all along, uh, and it was really, really good. Great facilities. Hardly any queue for the bar. Buzzing with a load of Fulham fans, whipping up some chants. It was, uh, and I just think if you're a county fan, that's wonderful to go pre-game and they open it up to opposition fans when they're when Forrest are at home, uh, which I think is a lovely little uh, money spinner. So good on them. I really liked it. Mm, I was sad not to have been able to make it yesterday. City Grounds. It's always one of the ones I look look out for on the fixture list. I think it's a, a great stadium and there's always a wonderful atmosphere. And it's even sweeter when you get three points. We've had some really good games there recent years. We won't we won't talk about last season for uh, for obvious reasons. But that three two when we had that hurricane kind of twenty minutes 
Jao Paulinho slapped me one. I think Harrison Reed got a goal as well. But yeah, always always good fun at the City Ground. Kipo, I, I'm always interested in uh, how America the difference between watching a Premier League, uh, you know, having a big Premier League day in 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 the UK, we can just sit in a pub and sort of watch it. Whereas in the States, obviously with the time difference, what are you setting your alarm for? Like what six thirty in the morning and then getting on the beer straight away? Is that how how, how do you normally roll? In, in a word, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, that's about right. The um, yeah, in all sincerity, so there's a massive, you know, I'll use the word this once. I won't use it the rest of the pod, but they're what we would call soccer bars, which are, you know, a collection of pubs almost exclusively. De- I mean, they function as full pubs, but they're ex- like exclusively dedicated to sort of the early morning. A lot of them in certain cities where there's regulations about what time you can start pouring drink and that sort of thing have applied for special permits. And these are nationwide where they're actually kind of cool. And they've, done, they've been a big, you know, shepherd of the sport here, I'd say, in the last two decades. You know, you go to any major city, you ask somebody what are the kind of the main soccer bars here, and they'll usually be able to name one or two. Um, they're, you know, typically pretty English in nature just in terms of either the ownership, the styling, et cetera. But a lot of people um, will kind of go, they'll migrate. And obviously what you'll do is you'll have about a dozen TVs and you'll have like, depending on the size of the city, maybe a little different if it's New York or Chicago. But if you're in a smaller city, let's call it, I don't know, Nashville, I'm, I'm making it up, but you'll still have a soccer bar with a dozen TVs and like four or five fans wearing their shirts in each little corner of the bar. And they, every five minutes, someone's cheering and yelling. It's actually a pretty unique experience if uh, you ever get the chance to check it out. Yeah, sounds sounds quality. I, I remember I went to a similar bar in New York where you had there was a little Fulham pocket. It was right next to the uh, Empire States building. There was a dedicated Fulham corner. It's a huge, great big bar. But yeah, as you say, you've got different like celebrations popping off. Um, yeah, it's mad. It's, what a way to watch football. Now, we've got so much to be happy about uh, with this Fulham side. And it was, believe it or not, the first clean sheet that Fulham have kept away from home since Everton on the opening day of previous season. Now, you look at this back five and for me, I think it is pretty flawless. You know, I think we genuinely have one of the most exciting, one of the most solid defences in the league. Drew, for you, when did this moment happen where we just became this kind of rock at the back would you say because it yesterday was a superb defensive performance when we when we signed Jock Anderson again uh, quite quite simply as far as I'm concerned he was fantastic again yesterday and I've said it before you know people talk about the resale value and stuff and there's just such a place for the here and now and he is a here and now signing and so it makes such a difference I was quite I, I was a bit overly harsh on Calvin Bassett on the quick take yesterday when I look back and uh, what you know watch the game back uh, the highlights back and he wasn't as uh and what I said was when you have a sense about partner like Anderson, who is so much better, uh, he can either elevate you or he can unwittingly make you look not, you know, not not as good. Um, and I was worried that uh, Calvin Bassey was a bit, bit shaky in the first half yesterday, but I think he was actually a, a lot better than what I remembered. And I think maybe I'd had a few too many pregame shandies, but notwithstanding I think uh, signing Anderson again I think has really sort of changed the game for us he's uh, so assured um, he needs to have the captain's armband frankly for many reasons I'm so one of which I'm sure we'll get to later with the penalty incident but yeah in a word Anderson yeah I mean it was a man of the match performance he, he was voted Fulham's man of the match yesterday George uh, I mean despite the obvious his sort of defensive capabilities what else do you think that he brings to this side which is sort of because it's been a bit night and day with the first few games when Diop was performing for us when he was playing he didn't deal didn't really do anything wrong but yet we are just so elevated on multiple areas of the pitch as well not just defensively with the with the what he brings with his distribution I mean how, how do you summarize the the impact that he's had George I think you're right I, don't, I think Diop started the season as well as he could have I, my issue with Diop was always that within a 90 minutes he can have a good performance but there's a blunder that's going to come. It, it didn't happen at the start of this season. But I think uh, what Anderson has over Tosin from last year and Diop, it's just he brings the calmness to those around him. Um, in possession, you don't have the same fears that you would have had with Tosin or Diop before. Uh, and like Drew saying, simply, it is just simply about signing him. But how often do you have a signing that is this risk-free? I mean, we look at some of the investments we've made when it comes to Robinson, Tosin, you know, they're cheap, but that doesn't mean they'll work. You know, their resale value now looks phenomenal. And a lot of people were questioning the money we spent on Anderson in the summer, but he's not past his prime. He's an established Premier League player we've had before. It couldn't fail and it's not failing. And like 
Fulham have voted him the man of the match. He was the man of the match in my ratings. I thought he was absolutely superb. Yeah, no, he he understandably took a lot of the uh, the limelight yesterday. Uh, but I I also want to give a shout out to Kenny Tete, who I thought had a fantastic game yesterday. He was one of those players who just sort of seemed like he was just everywhere. His his defensive positioning, going forwards, he almost um, won us a penalty as well later later on in the game, which we'll we'll come on to. But I think that he was superb yesterday as well and I just think we have a real defensive unit to be proud of here overall though I'd say the first half yesterday was it was relatively uneventful we had quite a bright start Adama Traore um, causing all sorts of nuisance as he does Kippo I was just wondering do you with with these games like Forest obviously we know that they like to sit back they're quite hard to break down at times and I, I feel like we kind of found it hard to create chances. Does this like lack of creativity concern you in any way that we sometimes see Fulham sort of enter large spells of the game and, and don't really create anything and get a bit frustrated? Yeah, it's funny. If you had asked me that a month ago, I think I'd answer resoundingly yes. But doing it week in, week out, week in, week out, and again, against, I mean, new, you know, at the city ground is solid. Newcastle is solid opposition, but ultimately it's a bit for me, the end justifies the means. And if I, you know, I have so much faith in Marco, if he wanted to deliver my child, I'd probably sign up to let him do it. (laughs) If he somehow in his infinite wisdom has decided that if we take a bit of, you know, spark out of the way we're pressing and attacking and moving the ball. And I think we all agree. We all see it. I mean, it's the nature of your question. But if that's a deliberate decision by him to sort of suck life out of the match, and this is the net outcome, yes, I think we're all going to need a bit of Xanax, you know, by the end of it. I think the nature of these kind of last five, 10 minutes is not always the most comfortable. But if it means we're getting results, then it means we're getting results. You know, the table doesn't lie. So I know that's a bit of a non-answer. And theoretically, yes, of course, I'm a human being. I'd love to see more attacking beautiful football. Who, who are we kidding? But, but I'm sort of able to justify it based on the outcomes. I mean, even yesterday, one of my notes I wrote down is, you know, loved a boring first half of the city ground after how it went yeah, last year. You know, we know yeah. what it can look like if you want to roll the dice and get punched in the mouth sometimes. Excuse me, if you're going to a hostile environment and you're willing to suck the life out of it, okay. You know, that's that's sort of where I net out. I also think what's interesting is that I think what the way we would have expected Nottingham Forest to set up was different to the way they did set up because Away from home, they've had so much success. I mean, they've started well in general. They were unbeaten going into this game, but away from home was where they got the majority of the points. And the way they set up at Liverpool with this start of thing that Guardiola's implemented, which is having these starters and finishers, was Nuno Espirito Santo boxed in the midfield like he did yesterday with the four central midfielders and then used Alanga and hudson Adoy as the finishers. And it worked perfectly at Anfield. But they've not played like that at the City Ground so far this season. They have started with hudson Adoy, Alanga, Gibbs White as well, who was suspended yesterday. So to see them start with that tactic that's maybe been seen as a tactic from away from home at the city ground might not have been what we was expecting. And as a result, that first 45 minutes was more of just a feeling out process, which resulted in that first 45 minutes being, it was very boring, is what everyone was saying in the stands at half time. Drew, what did you think of Forest as their performance as a whole? Because obviously, as George mentioned, they were undefeated going into this game. Uh, you know, picked up that incredible win at Anfield and have looked very impressive. And they do have talent across the pitch. Uh, did they? You know, obviously, you touched upon it in your in your quick take. If you haven't already watched that, do check it out on our YouTube. But how, how would you summarise what you thought of Nottingham Forest? Yeah, they they pretty much uh, were exactly how I and uh, sort of anticipated, even with the sort of change in um, in tactics, obviously forced from Gibbs White suspension. Obviously, we had. The majority of the ball in that first half, but Forest had the the more dangerous chances, and they were they were actually more effective with the ball when they had it, as far as I could see. And uh, but I, but equally, I never really felt like we were um, on the back foot at all, and it was certainly a feeling out process, as George rightly says. Like you know, we, we it was like learning on the job as to uh, how how they were going to set up compared to what we we anticipated. But no, I didn't feel I didn't feel they offered a huge amount, but they definitely had the better of the chances first half, especially you had the old uh, uh, one-year bicycle kick, and there were some other bits as well. So. Uh, yeah, they were all right, but um, I've said it as well. I said it on the old uh, QT is that obviously City Ground can get a bit toxic when uh, things go don't go their way, and I think it was always going to be really important to get 
the goal first if you could because I think as well as things have gone for them so far this season it, it's still those those things ring true and uh, it was just a perfect time to get that uh, to get that goal uh, just after half time to to get everybody a little bit frustrated in the home stands yeah let's come on to the VAR penalty George for me <laughs> I think it's the right decision I think it is a penalty but obviously you're at the game and you could hear uh, from the from the television uh, coverage that the Forest faithful were not happy about it. Um, what do you think? What was your take, George? Fair, fair decision. VAR well utilised. I think in the ground, I've, I wasn't really aware of what was happened because Pereira's back was kind of turned to we were, so I couldn't see the contact with Mario. But obviously, when you're in the ground and you see that there's the VAR check and they go to the monitor, you kind of you're expecting that change of mind to come from the referee. It's so, so rare that he sticks with his original decision. Um, I watched it back on match of the day this morning. There's obvious contact down the Achilles. Ultimately, I, I think we'll come on to this later. I think the one on Tete later in the game on the right-hand side of the box in the ground looked a much more potential penalty for me. But I think, yeah, on reflection, watching it back on the replay, I think it probably is a penalty, but in in the ground, I, I can't say I was sure or not whether there was a foul. Hmm. Any differing opinions, Kipo? I'll start with you. I mean, it wasn't one where, like you said, to George's point, in real time live action, you saw a bit of contact and you were optimistic that they'd give it. When the referee didn't give it in the moment, I wasn't like throwing things to the TV saying, are you kidding me? But once you get it slowed down, you look at it, you're like, I don't know, objectively seems like the right call was made. Yeah, true. When I'm in the stands, you know, I find it very difficult to have the objective hat on. So, you know, player goes down in the box, it's, uh, you know, straight up, fist in the air type stuff. But um, it, in this era of VAR, it's like, uh, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, it's going to get checked anyway. So, you know, if it's if it's a pen, it will be given. Um, and it's kind of like you almost have, just like when you score a goal, sometimes you have that, you can't celebrate fully straight away. When there's something like that, a contentious decision in the box like that, you, you kind of feel like it's going to, you know, work its way out if if it's a pen. So I wasn't too worried. And then obviously then it's so it proved, but it did take a seem take a little while. And I hate the in in stadium experience with VIR still. I mean, they've obviously put the things on the on the screens, but just get the stadium announcer to just say checking like. Um, where we were in the stadium, our, our, our vantage point, obviously you've got a crane your neck to the left to see the, see the screen in, in the stadium. And it's just like, just a ball ache. Like, just, uh, just make things better for the, for the fans who are paying to be there on the day, please. I, I, a quick interjection here to bring it back to the uh, kind of American versus UK dichotomy is I'm 99.9% sure. They're not actually, if you don't have a stadium announcer, Lord knows, they're not actually showing replays on the board, are they? It's no. just a graphic that says VAR. Yeah, it says right? a check penalty. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. so that's uniquely different, right? So in any sport here, basketball, hockey, football, baseball, Anytime there's a controversial decision, they'll show the replay 20 times in HD on the video boards, which is always a bit of a fun experience because you get to get the fans going absolutely mental. And it's, you know, it's, it's unique. It's different. But the thing we have that in other sports in this country with cricket and rugby, especially if it goes to a video decision, they will show it on the screen in the stadium. It's only really football here where it's different. They showed the offside though. The Chris Wood, uh, was it Chris Wood who was offside? They showed mm. that screen i saw that i saw the line and the, and the and the foot over but i don't know do they pick and choose it seems a bit weird but they definitely showed that because I, I remember looking over and seeing it seeing it there but. and again the, the lack of clarity from the lack of announcement i thought leno had made a brilliant save from that i was one i didn't know if they what they were checking for whether there was a foul whether it was for a goal whether it was for offside would you just don't know yeah and i had a friend with me who was, it was only a second game for a football match and like for him he's just like why what was going on and like it's it's just uh you know, it's just a bit confusing. So I just think it's it's easy win to try and make that experience a bit better. Yeah, they're muddling through at Stockley Park, aren't they? They haven't quite haven't quite cracked it, but um, yeah, hopefully we can have some incremental improvements. Let's come on to the penalty now. So Kippo, if oh, this was obviously our first penalty of of the of the season, if you had to put money, obviously we've got the benefit of hindsight here, but if you had to put money on who would step up to take our penalty, would you have would you have guessed Raúl Jiménez? I, probably yeah, but 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 not as a stone cold lock, right? I mean, I think it's a very fair question. Andreas is the set piece guy, for better or worse. So I get that 
component of it. And I'm, we'll obviously come on to it. I'm not going to chew more air up, but I think the bit of a uh, scuffle butt in terms of deciding was probably to be expected once it was Raul grabbing the ball. But I, I, I think I'm glad he did on a certain level. I mean, he he took penalties against Preston, I believe, right? Scored tw- twice. Yep. So we've seen him do it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad he did. But yeah, I think that probably would have been my get. But, but you know, gun to head, if you'd asked me before, I would have said, look, he's your striker. I think there's a reason for that. But I also completely understand why anybody might assume it might be AP as well. Yeah. George, how nice did it feel not seeing Alexander Mitrovic go up to take a penalty for us? Well, yeah, we, we don't really get many penalties at the moment. I think I was speaking to a mate after the game. And I think the last time... Well, one of the last times we had a penalty in the league game was the two Willian scored in the 3 2 win over Wolves at Craven Cottage last season. And obviously, Willian's not here. And I mean, the only penalty I could think of from a player on the pitch in a Premier League game, bar row going into that, was Pereira, who scored at the Etihad a couple of seasons ago in a 2 1 defeat. I, I don't know. I don't know if. You know, Pereira's just had a foot down the Achilles, if that comes to it. You don't really want a penalty taker that's in pain. But uh, I like like Charlie says, Rao's the striker. You know, you, you trust him to put it away from 12 yards. It's, it's, it's such an interesting thing. So obviously, Marco says it's clearly it, it was it was obviously Pereira who's the designated penalty taker. And, it, you know, Rao always apologised and he was clearly at fault. Um, and, it's, and that's fascinating because obviously, you, as you say, George, you don't have many penalties, penalties recently. So when it... When it was awarded, I think we we're all thinking, "Oh, actually, who is um, who's going to take this now?" Um, with Willian gone, and, and and I know in the past people have said that Pereira actually has a decent record from the spot. I think he's definitely been talked about on the pod before. Um, but I was uh, I was editing the positives and negatives covered by Stephen Sheldrake's brother Michael this week, and he had in there that Rolls scored thirty six or thirty eight penalties. So. You know, the, the pedigree's there and, you know, and obviously a lot of those are going to be in the Prem and some will be predate that. But yeah, it, it's obviously that whole treatment angle. Was 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 Pereira injured? I mean, it seems like uh, Silver was prepared for him to still take that penalty. So, and then that's a, to my earlier point about captaincy, obviously Leno's down the other end of the pitch, probably doesn't really see or know what's going on. And it just, it, one of those things where you just needed to have, uh, the captain come up and who knows who the designated penalty taker is and just say, right, stop this straight away. You know, you're taking this, uh, Andreas, if, 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 you know, if that was a decision based on the treatment or whatever uh, and, and nip that one in the bud, but he wasn't there and he didn't know, I don't think really what was going on. And I just think it's not a good look when players are squabbling over a penalty and actually history tells us that, you know, it doesn't end good for the person who wins the, wins the fight to take that penalty. And uh, his, Raul's run up, him and his run up to that spot <laughs> did not inspire much confidence, but <laughs> thankfully he got the job done. But uh, yeah, I don't know, not a good look. Um, whoever is in the wrong um, and just, uh, it's just, it's just a little bit weird to see. I've just got two things on that because firstly, you mentioned Leno maybe getting involved as the on-field captain and how the, the referee, especially with the rules with the referee, where they're saying the captain, if there's some sort of ruckus, the captain is the one player that can speak to the official. I've seen it online in the past couple of weeks that when your goalkeeper is your captain, he can designate an outfield player to do that job with the referee so that Leno's not running up and down the pitch. And in that scenario, that player is Pereira. So obviously Pereira in that case, you just assume is second in regard when it comes to the leadership on the pitch. So maybe you're expecting him to take a bit more authority in that moment. (laughs) Authority has been well and truly undermined. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say is it's quite interesting when it comes to who's going to take the penalties is that in a preseason friendly where we pretty much played a strongest 11, you know, I think Raul and Pereira may have been involved and I think we won six, six nil or six one. I don't know if it's against a Watford team or a QPR team. We always play them in preseason. It was actually Sasa Lukic who took and scored. To me, when you're in preseason, you're preparing for the season ahead. So I've always wondered why Sasa Lukic took that penalty if there was no plans for him to be involved in the penalty taking process going forward. I, I would say that meant I, it's a little bit, and I we're sitting six on the table here on September the 29th. So like, this is not particularly a complain heavy podcast. I think we are all on the same page there. If I were to be glass half empty for one moment, if you'll indulge me, I'd simply say that 
we're happy with Raul. His purple patch is terrific. Is it three and three? And he called that a streak. I think you said on the quick take yesterday, Drew. So great. Thumbs up. Very happy about that. Objectively speaking, we'll probably come on to Rodrigo at some point. But but in general, it's like if you really think about pushing for Europe and like I said, maybe we'll have this conversation on the back half of the pod. There's something about having just like a, a pure Every day, don't have to think about it, striker. I hope it will be Raul. And in that, you'd think there's also some measure of certainty around penalty taking duties. I mean, I have to wonder, you know, we, we all talk about, you know, penalties are so mental. All these guys are physically capable of putting a ball in the, in the net from 12 yards, right? And so much of it is just having that confidence when you step up, knowing this is my role. You know, there's not a lot of subjectivity to it. I, I just wonder if having a complete sense of solidity, like we were so fortunate to do for a half decade with our old Serbian friend. Um, there's a certain element of that that you kind of come to appreciate. And I don't know, I know for lacking it. Um, and again, I'm not really complaining, but but it's just food for thought. Mm. I mean, he got his 50th Premier League goal uh, on Saturday. He's now got 10 goals in his last 13 starts. So it's a, as you said, Charlie, it's a real purple patch and long may it continue. Drew, what did you think of his overall play yesterday, you know, penalty aside, just briefly before we uh, move on from the subject of Raul Jimenez? didn't pull up many trees it wouldn't it wasn't a performance that would live long in the memory but you know much like everybody used to say about uh about Andy Cole back in the day you know he was a great striker because he did nothing for 89 minutes and then banged in a goal and that's ultimately all that matters whether it's from the spot or off his ass or whatever as long as he's scoring the goals he's he's retaining the number nine position ahead of ahead of Muniz so no it wasn't the best performance wasn't the worst it was kind of you know was what it was. But um, out of those 50 Premier League goals that he scored, 10 of those have actually come for us. Um, and he's only been here a season in a bit. So it's funny when, you know, there's quite a lot of negative discourse around him and has, and has been since he arrived, you know, um, some of it some of it quite quite out of order and some of it more, more warranted. But actually, you know, the return for £5 million so far is, I'd say, you know, probably in this market above what you'd probably expect. So fair play to him. Yeah, no, I think that's a very fair comment there, Drew. Yeah, he doesn't matter how he gets them, whether it's from a uh, 40-yard screamers or putting them away from the penalty spot after a con- controversial VAR decision. It ultimately, a goal's a goal. Speaking of VAR, uh, do you feel like Bassi was potentially fortunate not to concede a penalty against Alanga, especially given uh, how kind of, you know, the, the penalty decision that had been given for us George, did you think it was a penalty? Obviously, it was uh, checked at length. There was some contact, but the referee deemed it to be minor and not enough to warrant a penalty. Uh, but obviously, it got the Forest fans uh, quite peeved. Uh, would you say it's fair, fair decision on balance? In the ground, you know, you're at the opposite end to the Trent end, which is where it happened. I mean, from where we were, it looked like a brilliant piece of defending because you see the tackle go in and the ball move and you instantly think he's won the ball. I think the dangerous thing is, not it, it kind of looks like he has a couple of swipes to get the ball and that maybe makes him look a bit more erratic than it was. But I, I don't think it was any more of a penalty than the one we got. And maybe we've just got a bit lucky on the day more than anything. I saw Michael Richards comment on it on it in match of the day. And I think he was pretty astute with his commentary, which I'm not sure he always is, but in this moment, I think he got it bang on, which is that, you know, when you slow anything down to frame by frame by frame, you can make anything look like a penalty, right? I mean, you, 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 you just can. And I think if you, that's one where you watch it in real time, no one here is arguing there wasn't contact or that he whiffed. There was clearly contact. But I think in a football match, when there's contact that's marginal in nature, I respect the decision to play on and say there was no penalty given. I think if they had given a penalty on the pitch, I think they would have been hard pressed to overturn it. If, if that makes sense. So I think you stick with the referee's decision and you know, probably the right call. There's um there's a great quote from uh, somebody who was interviewed on telly once and they said, uh, when it comes to VAR, when you're slowing things down and looking at every detail, sometimes a peck on the cheek can look like a porno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, po- poetic, I like it. There was, um, it was a lot of uh, sort of contentious and controversial penalty sort of shouts on this. Later on in the game, we almost had another penalty. Uh, Tete was brought down by Morello. For me, this is, of all of them, the one that I thought looked like the the clearest penalty. Uh, and uh, was it checked? No, so can somebody shed some light on this and rules-wise? Because obviously the ball didn't go out of play for what seemed like an eternity after that. And I was like, is there like 
and this might sound like a stupid question is there like a statute of limitations on the, like, the time it takes for the ball to go out of play as regards to a check do you know what I mean it like when it went out I was like okay so they're going to go back to that and then obviously they didn't I didn't know whether because as you say like in real time that looked like more of a pen from where we were sat but then just never got checked and I, I must admit I then it had been so long that I kind of just forgot uh, just a bit of a weird one really yeah very strange but yeah any any anyone got anything to add on that on the Tete challenge because for me I thought it was a I thought it was a stone wall but anyway what do, what do I know no I, I think I completely agree I think of the three that in the ground and even watching it back on match of the day it looks like the most obvious penalty it looked like there was the most contact there was the smallest attempt to play the to play the ball uh, yeah like Drew said <laughs> what what's a phase of play <laughs> exactly anyway it was a superb win we really really ground out as well as uh, as, as you pointed out earlier there was a lot of a uh, lot of injury time there just just from that kind of the feeling of 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 like really digging deep and 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 soaking up pressure and grinding out uh grinding out a result what what were you most proud of would you say of the way that we saw this game out charlie just the resolve I and mean, i'd love i think someone made the comment earlier forgive me for not attributing it properly but the sort of the notion i think it was nuno and pep have done this sort of starters and closers bit i think it was ug and i think that you know us using diop as sort of our closer and an american kind of pitching bullpen sense bring a guy in to close the game i'm all here for it uh, i know we took smith row off who we haven't mentioned and probably shouldn't um, was was a bit quiet but i think the notion of setting up shop being resilient um i think Joachim anderson who we could wax poetic on for another hour if we all wanted to i think to fat have someone like him who is so comfortable on the ball and so that when we get the ball in possession in our own end to not just feel the instant need to boot it, but rather, and, and again, you don't want to get too meticulous and set, you know, set them up and turn it over. But I think to have a bit of calm, a bit of poise, have someone like that to kind of distribute properly, go effectively. I, I think again, it was mentioned on the quick take, but I loved when we didn't really mention him, but Muniz having the chance to kind of run on goal at the end there. And it said, whether it was initially his thought or regardless of or maybe a stumble or a bit of loss of balance, but he ended up obviously going to the corner and kind of circling back the ball to really kill off the game. And for me, that was again, symptomatic of probably the way he's been drilled and the coaching. And I think, again, it speaks to him and the question you asked earlier about sort of our attacking spark or lack thereof. And if we are a team who knows that, you know, we're going to try to play one nil, you know, type football. Okay, let's let's do that, and let, it it means a certain sense of you know, like I said, resiliency, and it's a bit less sexy. But I, I just thought the way we defended top to bottom, and I think it's a reflection of our players. Is the last thing I'll say is we have a defense, both first string and frankly second string on a certain level. Maybe Sess's defending is a topic for another day, but in general. I just think we have the players who are capable of executing a game plan like that. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Charlie. I was just thinking like the, the quality that we've got in this squad as well and the depth is, you know, we're bringing some real, real quality off the bench. And I was thinking as I was watching this game, Drew, do you think any of the Nottingham Forest um, team make our starting 11? Because I, I was really hard pushed to find anyone, to be quite honest. Is there anyone that you from think you'd, any, anyone that you'd have? No, just in, like well, from yesterday and, and just in general. From yesterday, no. I think obviously most clubs would probably want a Gibbs White in their squad, but no, I mean not 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 yesterday. I I, I didn't think there was a huge amount uh, about Forest, as I said earlier, that really sort of I was envious of or, or wary of at all. Um, so short answer, no. But just a quick word on that on that eight minutes. I mean, obviously. A huge amount of time is probably the, one of the longest stretches you will probably get in a regular game to sort of defend a one nil lead. And if the Xerxes goals and the Ings goals are sort of that wake up call in what has been a really, really good start for us, like, you know, obviously best start in 20 years. If if those two goals, which cost us in, in total, obviously four points, but if they have been the wake up call to sort of for Marco to have these sort of new plan, these game plans and, and talking about this, this closes and things, which is really, really interesting. I think then that's great. That's, that's a really positive thing to have, have happened uh, when overall the sort of the, the, the net positives are huge. So um, really it was, uh, that was the most pleasing thing about yesterday. Um, and the fact that you said that it was a first clean sheet away from home in, in over a year, blows my, blows my mind. Um, but you know, that, 
that is a just as is just as important and just as exciting, I think, for this side and this start than than a, if we gubbed them five 0 Really, the player on Forest who I don't think would make our starting eleven. So I know it's a bit of a bastardization of the question, but who I kind of rate is Callum Hudson Adoy. I know we were linked with him at one point. Uh, I think he was brought in for a pretty modest fee by Forrest. I think their best chance of the game was him. He cut inside the box and had a shot that I think went just above the bar. Um, halfway through the second half at some point. I was stunned that didn't go in, or at least forced to say about Aleno, I should say. I just think he can do a job. But ultimately, we have a player like Reese um, or ESR, a number of guys who are a bit of spark plugs to that end. But looking at that team, you know, well, I think none of us think about Forrest that regularly. But watching him play, you know, whenever he sort of moved around, he was probably the one player out there who my heart would go a bit faster when when, when Hudson Odoi was sort of doing stuff. I just feel like he has something in him. He's got that classic sort of cut inside, get a shot, finesse shot in, which is very, very hard to defend. And it's amazing because the amount of goals he gets from that, just cutting inside and just unleashing a... A hell of a shot. Um, but yeah, no, it was good. We've ground it out for, for a long, long period of time towards the end. Just got to do the same at the Etihad uh, next week, eh? Um, that'll do for part one, I think. Don't go anywhere because we'll be back with some of your questions. Welcome back. It's the Fulhamish Podcast. George here. I'm joined by Drew, Charlie and George. Thank you very much for everyone who got in touch with questions. Uh, we've taken them from Twitter today. Before we get on to them, just a reminder to grab your tickets for the Fulhamish Live Show. We are going to be live after the Aston Villa game on the 19th of October at the Half Moon with special guests Jack and Loz. The last few tickets are available via the link in this description, um, in the description to this pod, I should say. Uh, do come along. It's, it's probably the favourite thing that we do as a podcast. It's always always really good crack. Um, have a few beers, talk about the team that we love. And uh, yeah, it's just great after the game. So grab your tickets if you haven't already. Right, let's go. We're going to kick off with a uh, positive uh, note. Here we go. We're talking about uh, Anderson, who obviously was uh, man of the match performance yesterday. Drew, Chris has asked, given Palace's poor start versus ours, is the Anderson transfer being overlooked by the wider media as one of the summer's best transfers across the Premier League? What do you reckon? Um, is it being overlooked by the media? Perhaps. Is it being overlooked by Ibs on Twitter? Absolutely not. <laughs> is uh, is the reminding Palace fans at every opportunity that uh, <laughs> they don't messed up. But, uh, yeah, it's telling though, right? Uh, yeah, obviously us sitting sixth and they're in the relegation zone. It's a, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great move. I said it earlier. It's what it's, it's been a, one of the sort of defining transfers of the summer, and, and I think will be for the season. But it's one of these things where uh, the more he does what he does, which uh, you know he puts in those nine out of ten performances week in week out. Uh, I think a lot more people are going to be starting to talk about it more. So overlooked now, perhaps, but definitely not for much longer. I've got a, a, a mate who's Crystal Palace fan who was just like, when it went through, he was just like was so upset. He just he just couldn't understand why Palace had done it. And like, why? Because they didn't need to. They had a lot of like money come in from obviously their high profile uh, transfers that happens uh, across the summer. And he's just like, I just, I just don't understand why you give up Anderson their loss our gain that is for sure George we've got a question for you here Daniel asks still a small sample but ESR seems to play a lot better and have a lot better stats at home than away why do you think this is it seems to be true like he does perform a lot better at Craven Cottage Uh, do you think there's anything in this well I think there's something to do with the way we play home and away Um, I I mentioned it regarding Nottingham Forest and the way they've been setting up but similarly for us you know we are obviously more likely to see more of the ball at home. I know that wasn't the case at the City ground. We, we did have a lot of the ball, but when you're maybe 10 yards further back, when you're not seeing more of the ball, he is having to come deeper to collect the ball. So he's further away from goal when we're on the attack. I do think there's something to be said for the position he's playing in. I don't know if we could get more from him at times on the left wing. I think he is doing well in the position he's in. I do think some of it is to do with the way we're set up with the midfield through that includes Pereira next to him. Because I think neither of them necessarily have a lot of experience playing that dual eight role, which leads to a little lack of positional discipline. Uh, so ultimately, yeah, the stats look better at home, but it might just be a case of a slight tweak to how he's being asked to play. But I think performance-wise, we've still not seen him at his very best. And I think 
the fact that he's got a few goal contributions already whilst not at his best and the team as a whole I mean we've we've, we've started really well and yet I don't think we're into second or even third gear so I think with Smithrow and the rest of the team still still lots to come yeah that's exciting that's for sure Charlie we've got a question here from Matt Hall who asks eight points clear of the bottom clubs are we safe already wishful thinking perhaps or do you think you know are you are you are we truly I, I haven't even thought about you know looking over my shoulder at any point and as George said I do feel like we're yet to hit fifth gear and we're going to keep improving and keep gelling are we are we are we safe do we dare to no, say no absolutely <laughs> not I mean, give, me, give me a break you kidding me I mean look right I mean look we're fallen fans right I mean if if cynicism is, is our breed is it not I mean I think that I'm very happy, and I think we're all happy. I think everyone listening to this is hopefully happy, and if not, you know, you need to get checked out. We should be in good spirits, hundred percent. But th- don't confuse that for a sense, an overwhelming sense of security or safety. What I will say, to be glass half full for a change, is that as the gap tends to seemingly grow year over year um, between the Premier League and the Championship, you know, with the just the consistent struggles of the newly promoted sides, kind of dating back to us. On a certain level, you know, if you can even if you don't want to peg all three, if you can kind of safely peg two of them, you know, I think Ipswich have drawn a couple games in a row. But in general, if you think Saints are probably a pretty sure bet to go down, you look at the way Everton are playing, you look at sort of those bottom, you know, kind of the peloton of five or six teams kind of in the muck down there. And and I think we would all say both in terms of the table and just the eye test, we're clear of them. So if you look at it from that perspective, I think you can have an element of confidence. And like you said, George, you haven't looked over your shoulder yet. Not, not, or have I really. So that that's the ultimate positive is that I just think in terms of the results we're getting and the way we're playing and the squad we have, I think we have a right to feel like we should expect to finish top half and comfortably. So, but I, I wouldn't confuse that for saying, Oh yeah, here on 29th September, we're good, man. Chilling. I, I, I think there's a difference. The first thing I thought uh, when we got the when we got the three points and we we got to eleven is was we're a sixth of the way through the season and we're a quarter of the way to safety. And the sooner you can get to that magical forty points, whereas in reality it's less than that nowadays. But it, you know it's always good to be overly cautious. Once you get there, then you can start planning uh, planning ahead. I remember it's Leicester City season when they won the league. It was Ranieri obviously saying all the time, you know, forty points, forty points, forty points. What? Because there's no point in thinking too much further than that until you get there. Um, but we're a quarter of the way there with a sixth of the season played. So we're in fine festival, aren't we? I also think what Charlie says about squad depth is really important. Um, I think we've seen with the likes of Everton and Wolves, you know, they lose a couple of players and their form goes absolutely out the window. If we get an injury or two or suspension or two, we're not in a position where we were two years ago. You know, we're relying on Nathaniel Chalaba to come into the team against Newcastle and he sent off within seven minutes. If you've got a centre back injured, you've got Diop and Cuenca. If you've got a wing injured, you've got Nelson, Wilson. If you've got a midfielder, you've got Kearney, you've got Reed, you've got Berger. The depth is genuinely across the board superb for, for, for the level we're at. Um, maybe not in goal. And, you know, I've written an article about Bender recently, but how often are goalkeepers, you know, injured? We, we don't need to worry about that too much. But I think this, the, the level of squad depth across the board outfield is unbelievable. Hmm. On the, on that note, Drew, uh, similar type of question, but maybe uh, a little bit more kind of grandiose. Weekly Geekly asks, a great start after some tricky opponents. Do we start dreaming of Europe? <laughs> at, at what point are we allowed to have that conversation? I can, I can, I can sense the collective eye rolls throughout our listenership, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask you the question regardless. What do you reckon, Drew? No, I think uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think we can start talking about Europe. I mean, it best start in twenty years. The last time uh, was what two oh three and oh three oh four, and I think we finished fourteenth uh, in oh two oh three and ninth in three oh four, maybe higher if we hadn't sold Sahara at Christmas. I think uh, it's it's a lovely start, um, but there's a long way to go. And everybody in the Premier League this this summer is most clubs have sort of taken it to a next level with their transfers. And I think it's, it's a more competitive league than it ever, ever was when we were in it last time. So I think, uh, I think thoughts of Europe are premature. I think we're probably going to finish 10th to 14th in that range somewhere, but you know, 
when you are a mid-table club like this at the moment, which is, by the way, what we would dream about uh, a few years ago, you know, it's those peaks and troughs along the journey that make it make it worthwhile and make it fun. So, you know, this is a peak. Let's enjoy it rather than getting too many you know ideas ahead of ourselves oh one can dream one can dream we've got a question here that made me laugh from connor rains i'm going to shut this one to you charlie yes do you all think polinia sheds a prideful tear every time he sees his understudy lukic get a yellow card in the similar manner he used to pick them up and could his record be in jeopardy because uh the the honestly the sasha lukic yellow yesterday was right out of the jail playbook if ever i've seen it it absolutely was and i think that you know I, does he is he getting a lot of run at Bayern? I know he was starting on the bench when the season first started, so I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't want to get mugged off on Twitter if he's started their last three games. I don't think he's getting a lot of play. Am I correct in that? He's, he's, played, a hun- he's played 112 minutes in all competitions. Yeah, okay, so I feel justified. So, yeah, I mean, from the bench, he's probably got it on this tablet watching along saying, uh, you know, nice tackle in there, Sasha. I mean, yeah, look, it's, it's – I, I think it's – a, from the humorous side of it, yeah, I mean, it's funny that there's a little bit of a parallel there and he goes in for the hard challenge and that's all good and well. I think ultimately the point I do want to make is, I mean, Sasha Lukic, what a man. Uh, it's Talk about a guy who came in, you know, it's almost to your point a second ago, George, about squad depth. Is, you know, it, as you continue to reinvest in the squad, you don't always have to bring in a superstar. You can bring in a player you have faith in who can do a job, who can learn in a certain sense under someone like Polina, be part of the system, get familiar. And when the time is right, you're put in a far better position to kind of step up and be a real... I mean, I don't think any of us, what, 12 months ago, would have thought that... I mean, Sasha Lukic is borderline undroppable. I mean, probably you could strike the borderline combat. I mean, he's undroppable for us, at least on current form in terms of the way we're set up and the way we're playing. And that's with a Sander Berga, you know, sitting there, you know, with his price tag on the bench currently. So I, I have nothing but praise for him. I, I, you know, the tackle is, that's, it is what it is. Um, but I just, I feel good about the way he's playing. And, and, and as we all sit here, yeah, I mean, would you like a Jow playing in your team? Of course. Who the hell are we kidding? We could all take a Jow. But all things being equal, it's not like, oh, God, there's a giant Jow sized hole, you know, in the field that, you know, that shows every game we're playing. I just, I don't sense it right now. I think ultimately there, you've got to give praise to Marco Silva because we saw when a key man in Mitrovic left the summer before, it took how long to find the solution? You know, when Rao wasn't scoring, it took till January to get Moon is firing. It's not easy to find a solution to a key player coming in. And as you said with Lukic, we wouldn't have seen this a year ago. He, d- he did not have his role in this squad. It hadn't been worked out yet. So for him now to be the first name on the team sheet at number six and to be operating the way he is... I think you've got to give credit to Marco Silva for that as much as Sasa Lukic. Yeah, no, he's a very, very tidy footballer and long may this run of form continue. Just on this note, Drew, we've got a question here from Black, White and Fred who asks, looking ahead to the City game, uh, so Sammy will preview it in, in slightly more depth on the Thursday club, so do keep your eyes open for that. But just quickly, he asks, do we stick with AP and Lukic in the midfield against City, given there's likely no Kevin De Bruyne or Rodri next week? Certainly won't be any Rodri. Or does Berger come in? What do you think? How do we set up against the champions? I think um, we've seen enough of Marco Silva's Fulham to know that if it ain't broke, he ain't going to fix it. So it's going to be exactly the same 11. And that's fine. Like, you know, in Marco, we trust, right? Uh, there's obviously going to be many schools of thought to you know flex your uh, 11 depending on the opposition and, and, and the occasion but it's not what he does and so uh, you know and he's had more success than, than me in the dugout at Fulham so I uh, I defer to him but I, I'm fully expecting unchanged until something goes wrong and he has he feels a need to change yeah, and I also think that is in a that's a roundabout compliment to Jakob Anderson on a certain level because I can't because rem- we've all said it. I mean, Diop didn't really do a thing wrong in the first couple matches of the season. Was he perfect? Perfect? Okay, maybe not. But in general, I don't think anybody in the fan base, you know, was clamoring just on his play alone. Take the Anderson component out of it. I don't think we were like, God, he's awful. Get him out of the team. And I think we came back. Was it, we came back from international break, right? The most the most recent one, and, and we slotted Anderson right in. And that's just exceedingly rare. I mean, there was the incident with, was it Jao Polina when he came off suspension last year and Luka just playing well and he didn't put Polina back in the side right away. So the fact that he saw something in training out of Jakob Anderson to think he was worth usurping Diop um, is again, another testament to how great he is. But yeah, to 
Drew's point. Nothing is going to change and nor should it. Yeah, long may it continue. Long may it continue. I think that'll do for today's podcast. The last thing we've got to do is name this bish. What are we going to go for, Kippo? You can overrule me here because this is my first time on secretarial duty, as I'll admit, but I, I like <laughs> massive tree points. Um, that's that's going to be my shout. Massive tree Dang, points. I guess my vote, yeah. Let's have it. Let's have it. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It's always good fun. Yeah, who is who is uh, who is yeah, it's, who came uh, in it's with that one? Stephen Tr- T- Stephen True Scott deserves his flowers for that one. There we go, Steph. Yeah, oh, it's been a lot of fun, gentlemen. It's always uh, everyone's always in high spirits after a fantastic win. As I said, we just got to rinse and repeat at the Etihad. See how that one goes. But yeah, all that's left for me to do is thank my guests, Drew Heatley. Pleasure as always, sir. Thank you, George. Charlie Boy, thank you very much for uh, joining us over from Florida. Thanks, Cubes. And Mr. Rossiter. Thank you very much, George. We'll be back on. Thank you. Yeah, Sammy will be back for the Thursday Club. In the meantime, have a fantastic week. Revel in the glory of uh, the six points. And before we go, Coops, uh, massive happy birthday to you for tomorrow when everybody will be hearing this. Big 3 hey. Got to be marked. <laughs> Big milestone. And, I, and I'm glad that we got the three points for the big 3-0. Oh, thank you very much, mate. I do appreciate that. It's like the, hitting 30 is like the, the moment that I, I kind of been feeling it for the last few years. But I'm like, if I was a footballer, I would be entering the twilight of my career right now. And that's that's that's, that's why we really, uh, that's the thing that makes me feel old. Other than anything yeah, else. you will not be offered a new contract, I'm afraid. You're, uh, <laughs> you're in that zone now. Have to yeah, absolutely. Down Off to the MLS with you, Coops. Yeah, <laughs> man. Get, get me, get me over to LAFC with uh, Olivier Giroud. I'd, I'd love a piece of that, absolutely. Yeah, or I could stop off with uh, with old Lionel around uh, your neck of the woods. Shit stadium. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Cheers, mate. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, have a fantastic week, everyone. Do it again at the Etihad. We'll see. We'll see. But we're seeing in sick. Happy days. You watch. You watch.